Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Extreme Performance Series video blogs. I'm Todd Muirhead uh, from the performance team, and today I've got one of my colleagues, Yaifan, here to talk about some enhancements that he's worked on with the scheduler over the last couple of years. Yeah, thanks for having me, Todd, and uh, super excited to be here. And uh, I'm a software engineer working in the CPU and NUMA scheduler side, so my focus is basically uh, trying to make ESXi scheduler smarter and be more performant, right? And then the work I'm going to present today is actually not just my work. Uh, a lot of credits actually go to my colleague. So yeah, and thanks to them, we can share these uh, results with everybody. Yeah, so I'm really excited that you're here. It's great when we get to talk about some of the more uh, technical aspects of what's going on behind the scenes that enables uh, the great performance on vSphere. So yeah, today I want to share the journey we went through that try to make the CPU scheduler more scalable. So if you look at the CPU design chain from some of our major CPU vendor, they are basically going through a very similar chain or consistent chain, which is they are trying to push their CPU model larger and larger over the years uh, in terms of number of core count, right? So if you look at um, some of the CPU from Intel, uh, five years ago, they launched Intel Cascade Lake, which has core count around like four cores to 56 cores for one socket. And now for the in Sierra Forest, which is something they announced two months ago, they're going to go up to 64 to 144 cores. Right? So you see the lower bound actually increased 16x compared with what we used to have five years ago. So that's definitely a big jump. And we're also seeing a similar change uh, from AMD, which is also another our major CPU uh, vendor. Right? So if you compare the third generation 10 processor with fifth gen processor, which is just three years apart, uh, it's almost you know uh, triple the number of core counts just in three years. Right. Yeah, this, the, the the core count thing has been really fun. I, the, the, a lot of the work I do, I test database performance, and uh, so I, I get I get a look at these systems right as they come out, and um, and and test to see how many databases we can run and achieve the throughput or whatnot. So, yeah, I, I know that our customers are 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 very involved in in uh, taking advantage of all these additional cores that come out with each new generation of of server. I'm also amazed at the speed at which the you know the core count getting increased over the year. I definitely didn't see this before, but then it just looks like recently uh, there's a pretty tight wall between the CPU vendors because the customer they really love the capacity. It's important to us because our the core of ESXi scheduler was designed you know a de decade ago, and back then the CPU model was small. Right back then we we're talking about maybe you know two core, four core, eight core max uh, per socket, which is definitely much smaller than what we see today. And a lot of the CPU scheduler algorithm actually was built, uh, ba was built based on that assumption that CPU model is small, right? So that gives us challenge, basically, how should we evolve our scheduler to make it more scalable to, be to deal with the larger CPU models. So that's one of the key challenges we are facing. And today, I want to focus on one specific area that we've been making some amazing improvement on which is the concept called idle balancer. So today I'm going to focus on this topic only. Uh, it's important because idle balancer is actually a very central piece in our schedule design. The idea is basically that in one CPU package, you have a you know, CPU that sleeps, that wakes up all the time. right? So when the CPU sleeps, it becomes idle. So we might consider making that idle CPU to become something called idle balancer, which basically scans through the CPU in the same package and see if there's contention. Right? So if there's contention, why not just put the work over so that you can help process it and you can improve the utilization. And it's basically a load balancing concept in the scheduler design. Right? And as I've also mentioned, because this is a like, per CPU package concept, per CPU package algorithm, that means you need to have some kind of synchronization to make sure the data is consistent. And that's where the problem comes, because as you have a per package label locking synchronization, as you grow the number of cores in the package, you will run into contention or scalability problem because you have more cores starting to grab the lock and eventually leading to even worse performance when you have you know, many cores grabbing the lock. That's exactly the problem we see when we, when we run uh, ACI bench on uh, isolate 32 core platform. And the performance is actually you know, 300 percent worse than when we run that on a smaller platform. And that's exactly caused by this scalability problem. Now, when right. you say 300% worse, you're just talking about the specific use case that's the worst case scenario. Exactly. So, <laughs> it so yeah, actually so always 300% worse. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly. So we actually see a larger impact on smaller block uh, IO 
uh, IO uh, is not across the board with so much degradation. It's mainly seen in the small block IO. And that's actually the worst case. So it's not like across the board 300% worse. So we are not doing that bad. It's just that in some case, we really want to you know, make it better and see what we can do. So uh, now I'm going to uh, you know, be more techy and then talk about the exact uh, operation we, we did. So the first one I'm going to talk about is actually we tuned the aggressive, aggressiveness of the idle balancer. So I'm going to explain what that does, right? So I mentioned that in order for core to try to become a low balancer or idle balancer and grab the lock, it needs to be an idle core. But you probably don't want to make any idle core to try to become idle balancer. Because what if you just want to be idle for a very short period of time? And if you try to become idle balancer, you're going to do it work. And then you'll be, you know, come back again. Uh, it's not really useful because you, you won't be idle anyway very soon, right? But then let's say you are going to be idle for much longer. Why not just become the idle balancer, grab the lock, and then register yourself and then so that you don't need to waste so many cycles idle, right? So that's a concept. So we, we, def we need a somewhat like a threshold to determine whether one core should be idle balancer or not. And as you can see, as you tune this threshold, make it smaller or larger, it actually impacts how many times you're going to hit the lock, right? If you have a larger threshold, meaning that you won't become idle balancer as easy uh, when you have a shorter threshold, you definitely have less time accessing the lock and therefore have less time you know, contending on the lock. So that's basically the idea. And in one of the releases, we actually went through a lot of exercise and then try to see what is the Best, best threshold for that. And uh, we increase the threshold in some uh, higher core count uh, machine for some workload. And then we actually see that giving us 200% you know, performance uh, bump in some of the uh, configuration. And again, this is mostly seen as uh, small block IO because those are the ones that get impacted more compared with the other uh, product. Right. So actually, uh, if I want to, I can make an analogy to make this um, you know, talk more intuitive. So the, the scalability problem that we see is basically you have a teacher that's managing a class of four students. That's actually very easy because anybody can manage four um, students, but then suddenly you need to manage a class with a hundred students and you're gonna start having trouble. So what this specific organization does is basically that, you know, you're basically asking the student to be more polite, meaning that they don't try to bother the teacher as much so that you have an easier time as a teacher to you know, not uh, fuss around and uh, manage all the, those difficult students, right? So that's the intuition behind it. I mentioned that the idle balancer algorithm is a package level algorithm, right? We, we scan through things in the package level and we need to have uh, synchronization in package level. And upon more, you know, uh, deep diving into this algorithm, we need to realize that not everything, not every uh, part of the algorithm needs to hold on to the lock. We can actually redesign the algorithm in a smarter way by shifting the data structure around such that you don't hit the lock as often as possible. We only hold them on to the lock when you absolutely need it, but then when you don't need it, you don't hold on to, to the lock. So that, that's basically the intuition behind this optimization. Um, and then if uh, I can make the, the same analogy again with the student teacher example. So it's as if you have, again, a large class of students that's asking for candy from the, the, the teacher. But let's say the teacher today only has a candy of like chocolate flavor, but then the students only want strawberry. Then you don't even need to bother about asking the, the student, uh, the teacher, because you know that they don't have the, the flavor you're asking for. Right? So you, you can have some of that information that's uh, outside the teacher that can utilize so that you don't need to bother the teacher. And then you give a teacher a better time in handling all the students. And again, this, um, Competition turns out to be uh, great. It almost doubled the performance in some benchmark. And these performance are all somewhat like cumulative. So and then you, you can see it's uh, starting to make a pre pretty profound effect on the benchmark. Yeah, I, I really like your analogy with the uh, the, the teacher and the students. Uh, it really helps me to, to kind of visualize what you're talking about with uh, yeah. these lock issues. As I mentioned, we have some package level synchronization for the idle balancer, right? And then the spin lock is basically the most or the simplest or the most straightforward synchronization primitive you can think of in the computer science world. But at the same time, because uh, it's simple, it doesn't, uh, it actually has a problem with scalability because every time when someone tries to hold to the lock, 
the lock object itself is to traverse the cache time quite a lot, right? It basically, if I ask for the cache, the lock object needs to come to me. And when part when you're asking for the lock, it needs to come, go to you. So that creates a situation where you just have a lot of traffic in the, in the bus where the data of the lock needs to traverse. And then that's basically slowing everything down. And so that's the problem with spin lock. And we later decided to say, well, what if we make it, we use some more scalable lock, right? So we, we later decided to try with MCS lock, which is more difficult to reason about, more difficult to implement, but then it's known to be more scalable because it eliminates this cache coherence traffic, right? It basically, you don't need to have the, the lock object itself traveling between different cores when you are uh, trying to grab the lock from different cores. So that's actually one nice property with this MCS lock. Um, uh, implementation. And again, by just swapping the lock type, we actually see a quite huge improvement. And then we saw about one, uh, sorry, more than 247% improvement in some of the benchmark. So what, what, one quick question, what, what does MCS stand for? Oh, it actually stands for the, the name of the inventor. Uh, oh, okay. So you, you, it was, uh, I, I, I don't remember, uh, but it was a paper that was published probably last century. I don't remember the, the year. <laughs> I'll, I'll look up his yeah. name and I'll, I'll link it yeah. below the video for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Very interesting. That's, uh, uh, do you want to do a time check? I think that's pretty much the, the content. I'll just close. If uh, no, no, that was great. So uh, one, one more question is, when, did, when were these improvements added into the, uh, the, the vSphere releases, roughly? Yeah, and uh, these optimizations, they actually went into different releases uh, across ADO. Which lines up with some of the server releases where these really large core cores exactly. have become available over the last year or two. Exactly. Uh, you know, getting above 64 cores per socket uh, in some cases, which yeah, uh, like exactly. you talked about in the beginning, has been, has been very exciting. But we have to do work like this in order to uh, enable the platform to be able to really take advantage of those um, those new yeah. new architectures, new, new, chip, new core counts for the processors. So... Very cool. Yeah, there are more ongoing improvement. Uh, you know, polar algorithm we are developing to improve the situation. You see, a lot of the scheduler improvement we are doing now is actually trying to evolve with the continuously changing hardware, and higher core count is definitely one of them, right? And that's why we we, we keep investing more time in trying to um, you know beat the curve to to be uh, in the lead position to be more scalable and then provide a better user experience and performance. Well, yeah, thank you so much for coming and uh, talking with us about, about these kind of lower level uh, optimizations that have been done to enable us to continue to scale up as the hardware scales up. So uh, thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for watching, and I look forward to seeing everybody on another episode of the Extreme Performance Series. Thanks, everybody.